Why don't we just pray? God, we just thank you that you are with us. That no matter where we are, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what may be happening in our life, that we can know this one thing, that you are with us, that you are for us, and that you're already fighting battles that we're not even aware of. So God, we're asking tonight, Lord, you would speak to us. God, that you would speak to our very core of who we are. And Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that you would wake us up again. God, that we would be more in love with you than ever before. We would be more on fire for you than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, Numa, it is so good to be with you uh, wherever you're at. Can you do me a favor? Can you get on your phone if you're not watching on your phone? And why don't you text some friends and send them the link and say, hey, you got to tune in. Uh, we're going to have a phenomenal night tonight, and uh, you need to be a part of it. Why don't you share it on your social medias and, uh, and all that? That'd be great as well. Awesome. I'm so privileged to be here, and my wife and I moved here in January uh, to take on the young adults role here at Numa, and we are so thankful uh, that we are here. I think there's a photo coming up behind me of my clan, of my people, and uh, that's my beautiful wife and my two kids. I just need you to help me to pray for my young man, Roman, aka the bull. Uh, he has definitely let me know that I need to be on my toes like never before, and, uh, but he's amazing. He's amazing. Well, I'm going to pray one more time because I, uh, to be honest, I need a lot of prayer. And, uh, and then we're going to get into the Word tonight, and uh, I really believe that God's going to speak to you. So, God, help. These people don't know it yet, but you know it, and I know it. So, God, I'm asking that you would help. God, you would clear my mind. God, that I would speak what you want to say. Holy Spirit, that you would lead me tonight as we look into your Word in Jesus' name. Again, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Well, happy Valentine's Day. Whoever would have thought we would have spent Valentine's Day like this? It's a bit strange. I, I don't know if maybe you tuned in. Maybe you're doing a, a Valentine's meal over Zoom. I don't know if that's a thing uh, that you did. But um, this is definitely one of the weirdest Valentine's Days I've ever been a part of. And, uh, and it's interesting because we as human beings are obsessed with love. Like we are obsessed with it. Uh, you only have to ha have, a, have a bit of a look like it's in our movies. So there's a whole like ser uh, area of movies that like romantic comedies, romantic drama. Like we are into love. Not only that, there is like TV shows that are like fully made up of romantic drama. One Tree Hill was one of my favorites. Please don't tune out. I've been saved and sanctified from that. Um, and that starts to show some of my age as well. But we're obsessed with it in music, and now we've even got apps on our phone that are dedicated to finding it. Like, it's all of this thing. And so we as human beings are obsessed with love. We're obsessed with it. Like, we want it, we want to give it. And I think it's really important that we pause for a moment and actually see what God's Word has to say about love. Because here at Newman Church, we have a core belief, a core value that the Word of God is and will always be our foundation. Not popular thought, not popular opinion. No, the Word of God is our foundation. And the question that we ask is, what does God's Word say about it? So if you've got your Bible tonight, why don't you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 4, and it says this. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoice whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance and situation. I, I want to say to you, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me that even in the midst of what we're going through right now, that we are not to lose hope that God's kingdom is advancing, that God's kingdom is ahead. You may look around and think, you know what, I, we're back here again. Oh my goodness, what's going on? But let me tell you, God knew what was gonna happen and his kingdom is advancing. There is no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper and we need to remain hopeful that God is on the throne. He's on the throne of your life and my life and we are gonna see the fulfillment of God's kingdom established on our life, on our world's, and wherever we may be. 
just a side note. But we see here in 1 Corinthians 13 that God has a definition of what love looks like. Again, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it said, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 15, 12 and 13 says, This is my command, love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down your life or one's life for his friends. We are obsessed by love. We know like we are craving for it. And it is actually a part or a need that each and every one of us carries. Uh, there, there is this, um, this thing that I came across. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And, uh, and as you can see here, there's, there's uh, different things. And at the very core foundational level of every human being, there are physical needs that need to be met. They're like things like food and water and warmth and rest. In order for us, for our bodies to actually work and operate, we need these things. Secondly, it's safety. We need a sense to have security where we're, we're not worried about our life ending or things like that. So a roof over our head, protection around about us. But the third thing, which I think is so important for us to understand, is this thing called belongingness and love needs. Every human being is seeking for intimate relationships and friendships in their life. Every human being. It's part of the way that we have been wired. Love is such an important thing. Not only that, love is so powerful. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says three things last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The greatest. Now, when I was growing up, there was a saying that we would uh, hear about quite a lot. And, and if I'm honest, I was probably part of it where there was a group of me and my mates who, who we would be around about, like just checking on each other. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this expression before, but have you ever heard that love is blind? Love is blind. Well, see, me and my friends would get together and we, we made a bit of a pact that, that as we started to date and get involved in relationships that we would back one another up and, and be there to communicate when maybe the blindness of love had came upon us. And we would have this thing that we would often say to each other or maybe to our other friends about one of the other guys in our group, and, uh, and we would warn each other, and that was um, uh, 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 this, this situation, there's a, a little bit of uh, PBC happening. Now, please don't judge me because I know you know, the Bible says, he who has without sin throw the first stone. So I know we've all been here before. But PBC actually stood in our language for pretty but cray cray. <laughs> pretty but crazy. And so we would be there like trying to help each other out. Like, because no one wants to go through that. Now, you're all judging me right now. I can see that. But let's be honest. Come on, can we be honest? Can we be real? I know you've been there too. In fact, the Bible says that if, if you haven't got a friend who will tell you the truth, you actually don't have friends. Uh, so I actually found out later on after I got married that my wife actually had some kind of her, their own kind of thing. It was actually HBC, which stood for like hot but controlling. You don't want that, people. You don't want that going on in your world. But love is powerful. Like it has the ability, like wars have been started because of love. People have been cheated because of love. Like love is a powerful thing. And the Bible says that the greatest of these three things, faith, hope, and love, is love. John 14, 15 says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So you might be asking the question, which is a fair question to ask, what in the world has love got to do with consecration? My answer is actually everything. It has everything to do with it. I love what Pastor Corey said in week one as he set this whole season up. He said, consecration isn't legalism, it's loving obedience. It's not legalism. It's not like I do this, it's the magic formula to, 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 to like get God to do what I want him to do in my life. No, 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 you've missed the point. It's not a religious act. It's not a formula to get what we want. No, it's out of a place of love for him that I lay down my life. I lay down King's stomach and uh, to, to seek after him. So then we need to continue to ask the question, 
is if love is so powerful, why have we messed it up? Why have we get it wrong? Why do we have this? And, and can I just specify this? That I don't think we have a love problem. I think we have a definition problem. See, we have, we have this idea of what love looks like, maybe because of that's what's been shown to us, or maybe that's the way that people have loved us in the past. And it's, it's formed our definition instead of getting into the Word of God, into the author and the finisher of everything and saying, what does love actually look like? We've already read in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. I'm going to read it really quickly again to remind you. But this is what God's definition of love is. It is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every situation. That, my friends, is what love is. And I really feel like we need to have a redefinition in our mind about what love really is. I think we need God to, like Romans 12.1 and Pastor Shim, Sim said to share this morning, shush, shush, shush. <laughs> Romans 12.1, we need to be renewed by the transformation of our mind. We need to allow God's word to change the way that we think. And if God would get in there and we could just listen and the, as, as the circumstances of life going, oh, all right, hang on, hang on, no, love is selfless. Then I think we would be transformed. So I've got three redefinitions here that there are many more, but for the sake of time, that I want to kind of look at tonight. The first one is love is selfless. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus says this. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. I have that bit like highlighted in my Bible. Because I need to remind myself it's not about me. And take up your cross and follow me. See, many times I don't think we even realize that not even Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and did what he wanted. The Bible says in John chapter 5 verse 19 that he said, it says that he did nothing but what his father told him to do. He lived a life of selflessness. Like, he didn't go around, you know what, I'm gonna, well, come on, disciples, we're going to go here, we're going to have a party, and then we're going to go there, and we're going to do, no, no, everything was in consultation. God, what do you want? That's why it was such a powerful moment when Jesus was on the cross, that Jesus goes, God, God, where have you gone? You've left me. Such a, because it was the first time in his life where he had not heard his father's voice and father's call and direction on his life. I think we need to realize for a moment that, that as we've walked into this, this life of Christianity and following Christ, that we actually have had to deny ourselves, lay it down, lay our old nature down and take up what he wants for us in our life. Love is selfless. See, many of us, many of us approach love a little bit more like Shannon Knoll than we do God's definition. What about me? It isn't fair. Enough. Like, like, it's like everything is about us. And we, and we go to God with this mentality of God, God, I've got this. I need a better job. I need a better boss. Pastor Corey, you're, you're good. We're good, okay? I need, I need better pay. I need better, again, we're good, okay? Uh, I need all of these things. God, I, I need a better car. I need a better, I need a better partner. I need him to be six foot two and like blue eyes and brown hair and just like all the athletic and yeah. And we come to God with this list of all the things that we want. And that's not a bad thing. The problem is priority. God actually said, come and bring your request to him. But what about we actually ask God what he wants first? Like, I feel like that's a revolutionary idea, but it's really not. Like, I can remember one time we were at a conference uh, in Adelaide. And, um, and we just finished this conference and this group of us going to the supermarket and we're heading back to, uh, to get some food, to go back to where we we're staying and hanging out. And I'm in the supermarket, and, and, and God speaks to me about this old lady who's down the aisle. And he says, Dave, I want you to pay for her groceries. Now, you have to remember, I'm 18, I'm, at home, I'm away from home, and I, like, I've got a very thin budget of what I can afford to get. But it's like one of those moments where God doesn't leave you alone. 
Like he's just on your case, left, right, and center. I'm like, I am fighting him down the aisle. Like I'm like, this no, surely this isn't right. We get to the checkout and I've got my things, and it just so happens that I'm straight behind this lady. So I have a decision to make. Am I gonna lay down what I want and do what God wants? Lady puts through things in the checkout, and I said, look, excuse me, I know it's a bit weird, a bit strange, but I, I, I just feel like I, I need to pay for this for you, and just let you know that God loves you, he's for you. Would you let me do that? Is that okay? And this lady kind of broke down and was like, oh, thank you so much, so grateful. I wonder how many other moments and opportunities, this is the way my mind works, how many moments and opportunities have I missed because I haven't laid down my selfish thing? Love is selfless. Number two, love is humble. Love is humble. You know, it's interesting. I see this happen many times. As I, I was a youth pastor for 10 years back in Bendigo, where I was from, and, and I'd have guys come and, 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 and catch up with me and talk to me, and they'd be like, Dave, I, I really like this girl, and I really wanna you know, impress her and do that. I'm like, yeah, clean your teeth, brush your hair, have a shower. That'll, that's, a, that's a really good start. And, uh, and, so, and so they'd come back to me, and I'm like, Dave, oh, I had a shower, I cleaned my teeth, brushed my hair. But nothing happened. I'm like, what do you expect? It's the magic pill? Because really, they wanted to do something that would all of a sudden cause something to happen back to them, that, that, that person to love them. Why? Their, their, their actual desire wasn't to love the person regardless. It was something to get for themselves. And I wonder how many of us subconsciously do things because we actually want something better for us that we try and be a friend with this person because I know that person, I know that famous person, that we actually go and do this or give this amount of money because we can do it publicly and everyone know how generous we are. Like, come on. That's not what we're called to do. Even God himself, who created everything, sent his only son to die a horrible death so that you and I could be back in the family of God he actually gives us the option to reject him. Talk about a gentleman. If anyone had the right to demand something of us, it's God. If anybody had the right to say, hey, I gave everything I had, you will follow me, but yet, no, he doesn't do that. He says, it's your choice. Come, follow me. Love is humble. The last one that I have is love prepares oneself. I remember um, when I, uh, I first started dating my wife. And uh, I asked her out on a date, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I've, I've got to make this moment like happen. I, I really want this to be one of the moments of my life that, that sets everything up. So, so I, I'm thinking about, okay, where are we going to go? Where are we going to eat? So I picked this place in Bendigo. It was a Thai restaurant. And, uh, and I picked it because it was, it was, the atmosphere was kind of not too loud and not too quiet, that it was a bit awkward, but it was just the right so we could have a conversation. Can I, just, can I just stop for a little moment? I just wanna help some people out here for a sec. Ladies, if a guy takes you out on a date and the atmosphere is not conducive of having a conversation, I would say he's not actually into you for you. Just saying, I'm just saying. Just trying to help some people out. So I, I pick this place and I think to myself, right, this is, this is gonna be it. Not only that, I think, you know what, I've gotta pick her up. Now, I had this like brown Honda Civic. We called it Doug because the, the registration was O-U-G-157 and my first letter was D, so we decided to call it Doug. Really, really brilliant, I can, I can tell you. Anyway, um, but I probably hadn't cleaned this thing in a long time. There was Macca's cups in the front seat, in behind, like, it was, stuff was everywhere, and I thought, I can't pick, I can't pick Louise up in this. So hours before the date of going to pick her up, I go and I start cleaning. Now, this, this darn car took me forever to clean. Like, I'm cleaning everything, and I'm finding stuff that I never knew even existed that I had. So I clean the car inside out. Why? Because I'm preparing for a moment. Not only that, I thought, you know what, I need to come with something. I can't just come empty-handed to pick her up. Guys, you need to write that down. And so I go to the florist, I get a rose, and I come with that. I'm preparing for a moment. We get to her house, and 
I knock on the door and as dad walks out, I take a big breath, hoping that I'm not being beheaded. And I'd say, hey, is Louise available? She comes to the door, she's dressed. Meanwhile, before that, I'd actually taken some time to groom myself, had a shower, brushed my teeth, did my hair, took a little bit more time than I usually would. But I prepared for this moment. I opened the car door, she gets in. And here's the other thing is I actually started to prepare questions of what we were going to communicate about. I had thought in advance about what the conversation was going to be. Now, you need to understand, that was actually really difficult because I'd grown up with Louise. We'd known each other for a long time. And I'd prepared myself. And I remember we get to, get to this point and we get to the, the restaurant. We sit down and some flowers there for her. We sit down for the meal and I'm thinking to myself about what we're going to communicate. And we start the conversation and I'm engaged with her. I'm not looking around at all the other things that are going on, all the amazing things. I'm engaged here. Why? Because I want her attention. I want her. Can, can I just say, we have many young people who say, you know what, I want God in my life, but we don't actually focus and say, God, I, I want your attention. So I'm sitting down and we're having a conversation, eating, and it was a great time, set these things up. You need to understand that normally I'm not a planner, but I thought about this. This has to be a moment. I've got one shot to make this really great. We have, have um, our Thai food, and it was really good. Then we get up, and I'd organize for us to go for a walk around the lake so I could hold hands. <laughs> thought about it. We interlocked with the intent to marry. Just made it really clear. And so we walked around, we talked, we went and got ice cream, we talked. Why? Because I was preparing, because I wanted to have a moment with her. I think so many times we feel like we do things out of a religious way of going about things instead of understanding that love leads us into a close encounter with God. See, there was all of this preparation that went on beforehand, all of this thought that went on beforehand, and, and, and all of this thing, and this is what the consecration season is. It's like the preparation for what's coming. You know, Joshua 3, 5 says, consecrate yourself. In other words, you need to take personal responsibility in preparing the way. Why? Because tomorrow, I'm going to do great wonders among you. See, it's setting yourself up, positioning yourself for God to pour out. Now, here's the amazing thing, is I actually left Louise with the decision if whether or not we were going to have a second date. I didn't have an expectation. I was just doing everything I could, everything I could possibly do to position myself to say, hey, I hope you had the best time ever. I wonder what it would look like if a generation rose up and had a posture of God, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it is. I just need you in my life. I need you to work in my family. I need you to work in my life, in my workplace. I need you to come through. I want you to come and pour out your spirit. I wonder what our world would look like if a generation moved their eyes off me, myself, and I, and onto God. What is on your agenda? I really feel like this consecration season is setting us up to take a jump leap into what God has called us. I was praying the other morning, and um, I wasn't going to share this, but I just was reminded of it just then. I'm praying, saying, God, I just, I just want you. I just want you. I don't, I don't care what it looks like. I just want you. And, and to be honest, like moving away from our family, our upbringing, like everything has just been, okay, God, we are trusting you. We just want you to be king of our life. And, I, and I'm praying in the morning, and, and God all of a sudden reminds me of this, this word that I'd been given a long time ago. And he said, Dave, as you, as you lean into me, as you hold back into me, I'm going to turn it into warp speed, and everything that God has placed on your heart, on my heart, is going to come to pass. And, I, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just crying, and I'm weeping. And even in my mind, I'm thinking, man, I've got to work harder. I've got to go faster. I've got to be harder. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do that. And God was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to do it. You are going to walk in a rhythm and in a pace 
that is sustainable, that looks after your family, that looks after the people around you, and I am going to do it. Why? Because my heart and my motive is like, God, I don't care about what's around me. I just want you. I just want you. I'm no one special. I'm like not this holy person better than anybody else. But I just have, have gotten to this place where like, God, I, I love all of the stuff that you've created, but nothing compares to your presence. Nothing compares to who you are. Nothing compares to what you can do. And I just wonder what would happen if there would be a generation that would rise that would just recognize the value that's found in meeting with him. I just wonder what would happen. Just in closing, I was reading the other day, and this has probably been my prayer through this consecration season. In, in 2 Corinthians verse uh, chapter 6, there's a story of King Solomon, and, and they've just built the temple. And like this temple, they, they had a tent, they'd gone to a temple, and man, there was no expense that was shared. It was like, it was like the best of the best. And, uh, and they built this temple, and then and King Solomon in, in chapter 6 has this prayer, and it's found in verse 41 that has rocked me to my core. And he says this, he says, that the temple is completed, and this is his prayer to God. They put out a huge offering, he said, and now rise, O Lord God, and enter your resting place. Enter your resting place. See, the reason it rocked me so much is because I'd already had a revelation of the New Testament. Pastor Corey spoke about sacred spaces, and he said how you and I are now the temple. And as I read it, I realized, God, would you come and rest on this temple? Would you come and fill this temple? Like, it blew my mind that the creator of the universe the Alpha and the Omega, the one that knows everything that is going to happen and that will happen and that's to come, yet he would choose to be a rest, choose to rest on my life and your life if we want it. Do you want it? God's no respecter of persons. I, I tell you, it's not like Pastor Corey and Simone have got this magic pill that they have every morning to make them like the. No, they're paid a price. They've laid their life down. They've gotten to a place where it's like, God, I, I, you can take everything else. I just want you. And I just wonder what would happen if a generation rose up and said, God, I just want you above everything else. Let me pray. God, I just thank you so much that you desire even more than us to be with us. You desire more than anything to come and live with us. And God, I'm praying in this consecration season. God, as we humble ourselves. God, this isn't a religious act that we're doing. No, this is something that, that is loving obedience that says, God, we want you. We're hungry for you even more than we're hungry for food. God, we want you to come and live in our life. We want you to come and be a part of what we're doing. God, we need you like never before. And God, I pray, like King Solomon prayed, that you would enter this resting place. God, that you would come and rest. God, expand your kingdom through me. God, expand your kingdom through a generation that are laying their life down for you, that put their agenda aside and say, God, your agenda matters the most. Even right now, where you're sitting in your room, in your bedroom, in your lounge room, I, I can hear I can see that God is placing a destiny in people's lives. That all of a sudden you've had a question of God, what am I to do? What am I to do? What am I to do? And God's just going, no, it's, it's just really easy. Just lay it all down. I've got a plan. Trust me, I've got a plan. Trust me, I've got a plan. 